Thank you, Molly. And congratulations again on fantastic organization. It is no small feat to organize an event at all, let alone virtually. And yeah, it's just, just not easy. So congratulations to you and Fort Ra Front, Front Range. And thanks so much for the invitation again. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I did see on the schedule that at the same time as this session, there is a, another session on open licensing entitled A Creative and Poetic Approach. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll counter program that with perhaps a, a practical and mundane approach to open licensing. And, and I hope you'll, you'll find some practical and mundane useful things to take away. So uh, let's get to it. Please uh, uh, go ahead and, and if you have questions along the way, uh, if you're able to unmute yourself and verbalize those questions, that would be great for me. I'm not terribly good at multitasking and checking the chat as we go. So uh, we can do that at the end, uh, but uh, just know that I'm not so good at doing that. So our agenda here is pretty straightforward. What types of open licenses exist? What are the consequences of using different licenses? And that's, that's something we'll hover on a, a bit. And then how do you search for content? Uh, again, I'll, I'll mention uh, probably uh, your OER team at your college uh, provides workshops and resources on searching for open content. Perhaps I'll, I'll give you a couple of tips and tricks that, that you haven't heard before, but uh, your best resources probably are your librarians and certainly your, your uh, uh, statewide project uh, under the leadership of Spencer as well. So let's get going. Uh, hey, first James. of all, let's talk about what we usually do, or what what maybe not at front range, but what many people in higher education, maybe maybe whatever your rival college is, they do this when when faculty members are are searching for content um, and they don't want to or have not been able to utilize publisher content uh, or they're not able to uh, create their own content. What many of our colleagues do, again, not at front range, is simply to steal the content, right? We know this is a dirty little secret in higher education that uh, all too often our colleagues will plagiarize their pl anti-plagiarism statements. Uh, and uh, a lot of our lecture notes and a lot of our online content are filled with content that we've borrowed from someone else. We don't like to see ourselves as, as, as this guy. Uh, we like to see ourselves maybe as this, you know, the naughty little boy or girl sneaking up to, to steal a cookie from the cookie jar. It's harmless, we think. Uh, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't, but we, we, that's probably closer to the image we have of ourselves in terms of utilizing the content of others. Um, and a lot of times, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of times I think we, many of us have this vague notion in our head uh, around the doctrine of fair use. Uh, we may have had conversations with uh, 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 department chairs, or if you have a copy shop on campus, you may have had conversations with them uh, saying, gosh, I'm only copying a bit of this material. I recall hearing something sometime, once upon a time, about fair use. If I'm an educator, if I'm a teacher, which is a noble profession, and goodness knows we're a nonprofit undertaking generally, uh, that uh, we should be able to use things under this idea of fair use. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. I, I, I'm not going to linger on this too long, but uh, I'll point out that the doctrine of fair use is just that, a doctrine. It's a legal doctrine. It's not Colorado, I think it's probably not Colorado state law. It's certainly not California state law. It's not federal law. Um, that, that is tested in front of a court if the copyright holder the, whose material you, you have used uh, decides to, to make a claim. Uh, and there are four tests that you see here listed here on the screen. Uh, the purpose and character of the use. And yes, education is more likely to be considered fair use than, than commercial, uh, a commercial undertaking. Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, or I guess copywritten work, it always sounds awkward for me. Um, more likely uh, you cannot reuse fiction or, or more, more likely you can have, do utilize fair use for fiction rather than nonfiction. Uh, there's a question around the amount of work used. You know, the, in my world, the urban myth is don't use more than 10%. Uh, 
And then the impact on the value of the original work, are you somehow, uh, by using the work or a piece of the original work, are you somehow um, depressing the market value of that original work? Overall, in my mind, this is kind of complicated and it's kind of fuzzy. There are not a lot of clear rules that I've been able to process. So uh, I, I say that by way of by way of contrast to one of the real value propositions of open educational resources. And here we go back to the definition of OER, freely available learning materials that can be reused, right? They're freely available so, and they can be, so can be uh, used. So there are two elements there, the free part of it, no cost, and can be, meaning you have the permission to reuse them. So think about it that way. There's this duality um, in open educational resources. When we think about traditional copyright, copyright is traditionally a binary proposition. It's either on or it's off. This work is copywritten. It belongs to me. It's in a box. You can't touch it, except if you buy it, you can retain it but you can't do anything else to it. You can't change it around, even though you bought it from me. Or copyright is off, meaning it's in the public domain. Uh, no owner exists or no ownership claim is recognized under law. For example, the King James version of the Bible, uh, the works of William Shakespeare, they're so old that the copyright has expired. Any plausible copyright has expired. Uh, so, so it's that binary proposition traditionally. Now in open education with, with open educational resources, uh, well, um, before I go on, uh, so I, again, I'll, I'll emphasize that uh, just because something is free of charge doesn't mean it's free of restriction. Uh, a lot of the works that we find online, going back to that image of the, of the thief or the, the, the hand in the cookie jar, um, we know that... Um, you can go on to lots of websites, you can go on to YouTube, you can copy and paste things, you can download things for free. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're permitted to change it, to redistribute it, to do a lot of other things with it. Now in the OER world, uh, the promise of OER is organized around what, what's termed the five R's. The ability that you have and your students to retain content, right, to keep it, to reuse it, right, to, you, you can use it once, but you can use it multiple times, to remix it, meaning that, that Lego approach that I mentioned earlier, uh, you're taking a chapter from this, a chapter from that, an image from here, an image from there, and, and remixing things. You can revise the material, you can rewrite the material, you can, you can take out the name uh, the names Molly and James, and you can put in the names Jose and Maria because that's what your students' names are. And you can redistribute the material, meaning you can share it with your, with your colleagues, share it with educators all over the world, and of course, share it with your students legally <laughs> without, without any, any legal challenges. But, you know, it's, it's, it can be kind of complicated, so I'll make a similar point again that uh, OER generally has two conditions. One, that it's free in sense of no cost, and another that it's free in the sense of no restriction. So OER lives in that overlap where you find no cost, but also no legal restriction because of copyright. Uh, the most common uh, licensing regime that we find in the open education space is called Creative Commons. That's probably a familiar term for, for many of you. Uh, creative Commons is a, a way, a legal way to transform the all rights reserved of copyright, the binary, like it's on, it's mine, to some rights reserved. It's still mine. This slideshow is licensed by me it, 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 it belongs to me. I created it. But the license that I choose to put on it says, you can use it under some conditions. And we'll talk about those conditions in a minute. Uh, generally, Creative Commons or 
any open license says that you can, you, the creator retains the copyright while allowing others to copy, distribute, reuse their work without asking permission first, it's just there. In other words, a, a, a Creative Commons license is a way of signaling to the world, hey, I'm here, use me. Creators get credit for their work, and we'll talk about how that happens, but also choosing uh, the permissions that they give to other users. And Creative Commons licenses do not, and this is a super important point, they do not negate copyright. Creative Commons licenses layer on top of copyright. They sit on top of copyright, so they modify copyright in a sense. They signal to the world that there's something else going on there. When you get in into OER and you start looking at uh, uh, Creative Commons licenses and maybe you go to, go to workshops on your campus or, or other, other OER workshops, you'll start seeing all these little icons and all these little weird little circles and dashes and lines and, and it can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, so I wanna pause for a second and, and talk through what some of those might be. Uh, well, I'll back up. Uh, in essence, all of these little icons are Vi visual representations of different conditions, of different licensing conditions, going back to um, a Creative Commons license giving the creator the option to choose what conditions, under what conditions somebody can use the material. So, so let's take a look at the primary main conditions that you will encounter if you're creating materials, you'll choose what license you want to utilize. But just as importantly, if you're looking for, searching for materials that you want to use and you wanna do it legally and ethically, then you wanna understand what these conditions are so that you respect the intent of the creator. On the left-hand side, you'll see, uh, at first row on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a circle with a little image of a person inside of it. Uh, that person uh, symbolizes the requirement that if you use the material, you give attribution to the creator, meaning you, you say, this is by Molly Thompson, or this is by Bob Wanch, or Maggie, Maggie, Maggie Prater, uh, wh whose, whose, whose names I see on my screen. Uh, uh, so that if I reuse it, I have to give credit to the author. It's like a citation in our scholarly worlds, um, and it's commonly referred to as the by the name Creative Commons by, because you have to say it's by somebody. The next row down is with that backward arrow is a uh, backward circle and arrow is a requirement to share alike. So if you uh, reuse some material, um, uh, let's say you take a slide from my slideshow and you utilize it in your own slideshow. Uh, and, and let's say I have an share like condition on my license, then you would be obligated to share your new creation in a similar way under a similar license. So let's say that I uh, put a non-commercial, the next row down, a non-commercial clause on the use of my work and followed it by essay, non-commercial share alike. That means you as a fellow educator, you're not doing a, not, not engaged in a commercial undertaking, so you're welcome to use it, no problem, but you have to share it with others that the new creation, whatever you put together, you have to share it also as a non-commercial share alike uh, piece, of, piece, of, piece of material. So you can't change the conditions under which something is shared if there's a share alike icon. The next row ha ha with the dollar sign through it uh, indicates non-commercial. So if you as a creator put that on your content or if you as a user and educator uh, wanna use material that has a non-commercial license on it, it means that's fine, you can use it, but you can't sell it. So you can download all kinds of pictures from a website that are, that are licensed uh, CC by NC. You can build, a, build a, a beautiful calendar, wall calendar, distribute it, give it away to your colleagues on campus, give it away to the community but you can't sell it because that would be a commercial activity. But we'll talk more about that in a second. And the final uh, symbol with the equal sign in the circle indicates the condition of no derivatives. Uh, generally, that means that if you would utilize my material and I licensed it, no ND or no derivatives, 
I think my material is so complete. It expresses my intent so ideally and completely that you can use it, but you can't remix it. You can't add things to it or take things out of it. It's a package. You have to have to use the package just as it is. Uh, so there, there's some limitations on, on non-commercial and non-derivative works. Um, let's talk a little bit more about whoops, what those will be in, in just a second. Here you see uh, a visual representation of all of the licenses, all of the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, you'll see that on all of them, uh, you have the icon of the little person. Uh, so the attribution, whoops, pardon me one second. I'm getting so excited talking to you that I knocked something over on my desk. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, so that with all of the licenses, you have to give attribution or credit to the original author of the work. Uh, and, and later on, we'll talk about how you do that. Uh, so that's a condition for all of the licenses, and you'll see that there are a variety of them. Uh, the one at the top uh, on the left-hand side that has a zero uh, included indicates public domain, that there's there's no, you as a, as a creator, if you utilize that, you're saying, I'm kind of, you know, I put this out into the world. I, I don't need credit. Just it's there in the world. Everybody can use it. No worries, no conditions, but you, you don't necessarily need to give me credit. You can, but it's not a requirement. So again, these are use, most useful for you if you're looking for content. Let's say you go to a workshop on searching for OER content, and then you go back to your, your, your desk and you say, oh boy, I'm excited. I'm going to find some stuff today. Great. You should check what the license are licenses are so that you know that you're utilizing in a way that respects the uh, intent of the creator. So let's 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 pause for a second on the licenses that have non-commercial and no derivative clauses and talk about some of the some of the el particular elements of these. Um, I put up some uh, on the left hand side let's start with non-commercial I put up some pros and cons uh, and I wondered if if as I was talking through this, any, any pros and cons occurred to you uh, about a non-commercial limit or license on, on some material? Anybody want to ha have any thoughts about that? If not, that's okay. I've got, got a, few, a few thoughts here on the screen on the left-hand side. Uh, a, negative a negative aspect of non-commercial license is that there are limits. There, there, there are ways in which you can't use the work, in which someone can't use the work, right? Somebody can't use the work in some particular ways. So you're putting something out into the world, but you're, you're, you're narrowing the parameters in which the world will encounter your work. Um, so James, would a, uh, a paper or a book uh, that you might be writing uh, be an example of that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, um, if if you if you publish if you publish was that was that Bob or who, who yeah. asked that question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Uh, so let's say that you publish something with a traditional a traditional publishing house. Uh, that traditional publishing house is going to uh, uh, put traditional copyright on it, and uh, you know, it's closed, it's in a box, you have to respect whatever the commercial publisher puts on it, which typically would be nobody can touch it, nobody can use it. But let's say that you work with the, you know, the front range community college publishing house, and you want to put it out into the world as OER. Uh, you could place a non-commercial license on that work, and people could download it, copy it, print it out, no problem. If it's in a non-commercial, if there's a non-commercial license, then uh, a student of yours could not resell the book. But it also means that Pearson publishers could not legally come along and reuse that work and integrate that into one of their commercial textbooks, which is one of the reasons, and we'll talk about that under the pro, one of the reasons why some people in the open education world do indeed like the idea of a non-commercial license because it's, well, and we'll I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, one of the mm, fuzzy areas in the minds of many people is 
has to do with uh, college stores. You know, you, you, in my institution, a lot of institutions, the college store is a third party vendor, Barnes and Noble or Follett or something. What is it at Front Range? Yeah, it's third party, Barnes and Nobles, I think. Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, that, that you know, so they're a business. They got to they gotta pay the bills. They got to pay their employees, right? Um, and, and certainly there's a markup there. There's some kind of a markup there. So that's a, in the minds of many people, that's a fuzzy question. But in the minds of Creative Commons, and we, Creative Commons has clarified this many times for U.S. higher education, uh, there's no issue there. For if, if there's if if Bob places a non-commercial license on his work, and your Barnes and Noble redistributes that and marks it up, that that does not violate a non-commercial license, according to the folks at Creative Commons because it's, you know, it can broadly be understood as cost recovery. Barnes and Noble pays a, pays a, a lease to the college. They have, their employees like to eat, their employees like to have shelter. So the employees need to be paid. The college store at Front Range has to pay, it, pay some, something to uh, the headquarters of Barnes and Noble and so on. So that's, that's okay with a non-commercial license. Now, if we look at the advantages in the minds of ed lots, some educators, an advantage of using a non-commercial license is the sense of the mission that we have. Uh, generally, in higher education, we, we are engaged in a nonprofit enterprise. Generally, in education, we, we succeed when we share our knowledge, right? We're in the business of giving away our knowledge, right? All the years in grad school, all the tens of thousands of dollars in grad school, all the stuff that we filled up our heads with, uh, we want to give it away. That's a success for us. So for many of us, um, not a nonprofit and mission feels more comfortable. So some of us will say, golly, I want, I want my work to be out in the world, but those SOBs at Pearson, I really don't want them to reuse my work and, and, and uh, uh, make a profit off of my work um, because I disagree with their mission. So that, that's the, the train of thought of some people who use a non-commercial license. Another train of thought of people who use a non-commercial license is that those uh, folks at Pearson are uh, utilized, and when they utilize our material, they're uh, doing so in a way which increasingly is online uh, through access codes and, and online homework systems, and they are luring students into their surveillance regimes. They might say, Gosh, we've got Bob's book from from Colorado. It's it's free. Uh, come on, students, you don't have to pay for a book. Uh, pay us a dollar for the access code and log on to to our homework system. That's going to ask you questions about Bob's book. We're, we'll create a test bank around it. But what's happening then? The students are having their data exploited, extrapolated, sold without their knowledge, perhaps without their permission. If they are getting permission, it's, it's, it's expressed in a form that our students don't understand, that I don't understand, let alone students understanding. Uh, so some people object to the, uh, their materials being utilized as a, uh, as a bait for students to uh, be brought into that surveillance regime of, of commercial publishers. Hey, James, it seems like a lot of these center around if you make like you can't make a profit off this right and so my question is um, what if you're not making a profit what if uh for example like if i bought a textbook from the bookstore and i did my semester and then i gave it to my roommate so he could use it for his semester i mean there's nothing wrong with that however it seems like there may be a little bit of a hiccup if it's digital um, well, if, it, if, it's, if you're redistributing, let's go back here, that, uh, a, that one of the core permissions of open educational resources that is granted by a Creative Commons license is the ability to redistribute. Um, let's say I pay, pay $10 for Bob's book and then I sell it to my roommate for $10. That's not a that's not a for profit undertaking. That that's that's cost recovery, which uh, 
would e apply equally to you and your roommate as it would to Barnes and Noble bookstore. Cost recovery, you gotta stay in business, you gotta keep your head above water. You're not selling it for $20 to your, to your roommate. Now, of course, this, this all you know, depends on whether or not uh, you know, the author finds out about it, the author you know, makes a claim, et cetera. To, to, a, to a large extent, what we're talking about here if we're authors or creators, if we're putting things into the world and we're choosing a license, a lot of what we're talking about really is expressing our ethical intent. But And the reality is most of us are not outfitted to track it. Most of us are not going to know uh, that the roommate's selling a book to another roommate. Some of us, you know, some of us have the unfortunate you know, experience of encountering our work for sale on Amazon or our work um, uh, being being included in in a Pearson product. That's that certainly has happened. Um, so, uh, for most of the years of the open education movement, um, the most common license that you would find in the most common license that people like me would promote would be CC BY that says, you simply have to give attribution to the author, but you can do anything else you want with it. Pearson, that, that gives Pearson the permission to use it, to reuse it for commercial purposes. But digitally, oh. right? Yeah. Digitally, it's, it's kind of a different story, right? Like, for example, I bought, I bought a digital book for my, for my class because I I don't have room in my house for a bookshelf, right? Mm -hmm. But I have plenty of room on my computer for tons of PDFs. Yeah. And I often find in, in my classes that the first couple of weeks, right, until um, any, any kind of grants or any, any kind of monies are paid, it takes a couple of weeks after school starts. And for those first couple, sometimes up to three weeks, right, they don't have a book. Yeah. Right? Now, if it was real life and I had a real book, I could loan my book to them. Yep. However, since it's digital, there's some, you know, you like you can't do that, right? You can, you can. It's just kind of gray. Well, so let's let's talk about: Are we able to, and are we permitted to? Are we able to share materials digitally? If 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 you and I, you know this slideshow, I've put zero digital rights management protection on this slideshow. So you, you are able to share it, redistribute it, and so on. If you've purchased materials from an outfit like Pearson or Cengage or McGraw-Hill, uh, they have, or, or, or let's say you've downloaded songs, you know, from Spotify, uh, those outfits have put digital rights management restrictions on the files so that we literally are unable to, you know, it's not a matter of ability. We just are unable to right click and copy. We're unable to save it to our desktops. We're unable, unable to print it. So the, the legal permission is a different question. Does, does that help a little bit, Bob? Yeah, I, a little bit. I, I, I literally bought a, a a PDF off Amazon, so I have I have literally a PDF version that I could just redistribute to whoever I want. It's, awesome. it's a PDF, right? But am I permitted to? Right? Am I permitted to loan that out like I would a regular book? Right. And, and how would I make sure that they erased it after they were? You know, that, it, it's really gray. It feels like. It is, it is indeed gray, and, and I'm going to turn for a second to Molly. Molly, do I understand that you're a librarian? Yes, yes, I am a librarian. So Molly is the most qualified person here to, to, to discuss uh, digital rights management and uh, the difference between uh, purchasing something for individual use versus purchasing something for institutional use, et cetera. Molly, do you want to comment briefly? Yes. Um, I mean, I think, Bob, with the situation that you are describing, probably I would not share the PDF with um, others just for that very reason. You 
don't have control over um, who's using it or for how long. So I agree there is a, a gray area, but um, I probably wouldn't do it. Thank you, Molly. And this brings us back to really the, the one of the beauties of creating material with an open license and utilizing material with an open license. Because most of the time, if you're respecting the intent of the license, you don't get into these gray areas by and large. So we're gonna go back to, to the non-derivatives for a second, but thank you, Bob. It's really helpful uh, discussion, but yeah, there, it is fuzzy. Um, yeah, with, super helpful. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, it's a little more clear to me now, at least. Oh, thank you. I, I, a little, uh, hopefully a little, yeah, a little bit. Um, I wanna mention the, not, the no derivatives license as well that you may encounter. You know, you may encounter something that's licensed, no derivatives, and you think, oh, geez, can I, I, I want to insert this into my PowerPoint, or I want to use this chapter in a compilation I'm building. Am I able to do that? Um, and that's also kind of fuzzy. I'll, I'll illustrate it with some clear examples on both sides of the, of the extreme. A clear example of something that's a derivative, that you are making, creating a a new work by, by transforming the original would be if you take a novel and you transform that into a movie, uh, that's a you know, a, clearly a new work, a new creation, uh, or it's, it's different enough that, that the law would consider it a derivative. Uh, translating uh, a written work, an essay, into another language because inter interpreters and translators uh, they take creative license, of course, to, to, to do that work. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, a non-derivative work, so something that you could do, even if material is licensed non-derivative, you could do the following. You could correct punctuation or spelling. Right? You, you download a book from College of the Canyons and you find out that our editing process wasn't, wasn't what it should be. And you want to use the material, but you want to clean it up for your students. Awesome. Go for it. No problem. Uh, file formats, converting something from a, from a PDF to HTML or converting something from a Word doc to a PDF. Uh, that would also not be considered derivative because there's no creative interpretation, creative license. It's not a, under the law, it, wouldn't, it would not be considered a, a new enough, unique enough work to qualify as a derivative. Now, the fun fuzzy things that you can philosophize probably with Molly about is that, that middle ground. Um, so I want to make want to make you aware of these issues that you know we don't we're not we don't have the clear lines here, but it's important I think that you're you're aware of them if you're searching for content. But if you do find content and you have questions, uh, Molly, wh whom would whom whom would a faculty member turn to uh, if 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 the faculty member downloaded some content that had these licenses and they're, they're just, just weren't sure what to do? Um, definitely check with your librarians, campus librarians, and um, there's also the OER Council at Front Range, and they can also help. Thank you, Molly. Some of those Appreciate questions. That. Great. So, so James, if I yes, could belabor the point, uh, you know, and Bob brings up a good, good uh, uh, case. I think um, one of the things I often do is I uh, take screenshots of parts of books. Uh, that I have electronic forms that I have access to, <clears throat> and I incorporate them in slides. Um, now, if I were to upload this to uh, an OER uh, uh, arena, wh where is the governance for the copyright issues in regards to that? Is is it is it the onus mine? Is it maybe the original authors, uh, you know, cronies that are, are browsing around, particularly in, you know, the OER website uh, for plagiarism. Uh, I mean, yeah. it is plagiarism, but it's copyright issues, of course. Yes and yes, Bob, yes. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's incumbent upon us as educators who want to be ethical models for our students. Um, it's up to your institution that wants to avoid legal liability. And that 
perhaps is one of the reasons that we're having a workshop on this topic, you know, that, or that you continually have workshops on this topic. Um, and it's up to uh, the owner or creator to identify violations of, of the copyright. So it's, it's all of those, Bob. There, there, are no, there are no OER police and there are no copyright police. And there are no fair use police. Yeah. You know, OER is not different in that sense. What I, I would like to make the case to be is that OER is advantageous because the license tells you what permissions you have so that you can reuse things in a legal and ethical manner. The typical things we do of you know copying and pasting things, uh, that's pretty fuzzy, right? We 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 don't think of ourselves as thieves. We might think of ourselves as sticking our hand in the cookie jar, um, but there's there that's pretty fuzzy. Yeah, it's it's uh it, it's just yeah. I, I'm not a lawyer either, and it's always uh, befuddling to to see how um, well I'm in the sulfur industry and. Um, how these uh, companies sue one another. Uh, yeah. Case in point, IBM a few years ago sued Linux.org, the uh, you know the people that that write Linux, because apparently somehow probably one of the IBM engineers contributed proprietary software to to Linux, and uh, IBM got a you know wind of it and, and sued Linux. So. You know, there's just a lot of potential there, and whether yep. it be whether it be intentional or accidental, probably I would think more accidental. Um, that's just the thing you have to be aware of. Yep. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that, and I hope this is helping helping people think things through. So, to, to move on, uh, we want to talk shift shift our attention right now a little bit to to the idea of searching for OER. Um, how do you? But that begins, of course, with the question of what criteria do you use as a subject matter expert, as, as a faculty member when you search for, for material? This is a, a common question that, that I get it, it from, from people is, gosh, what quality do I use? What criteria do you OER folks use to select the OER? And I like to ask, pose the same question. What criteria do you use to select commercial material? When I was a new faculty member, I used to uh, I, I used a couple of criteria. One was that the uh, uh, publisher vendor was nice and brought me cookies. And uh, the other criteria was that when I opened up the cover of the book, the authors had uh, fancy institutions associated with their names. I thought, holy smoke, somebody went to the University of Chicago and Harvard. This must be a good book. You know, now, now I think I know better. I'm not as impressed by the cookies or the, uh, the elite institutions anymore. Um, so uh, I, I encourage you to consider, you know, what criteria do you really use to, to select a commercial book, apply the same or perhaps more criteria to uh, selecting OER. So if you look at the, at the, at the tiny URL here, um, tinyurl.com forward slash ZTC rubric, you'll see uh, some thoughts uh, about the criteria that one could use. Currency, relevancy, reading level, Accuracy, accessibility uh, are criteria we hope we consider when we're selecting materials for our students, uh, whether it's commercial or open. So you're welcome to, to, to grab that rubric. That's openly licensed, of course. I'll share a few search tips with you. And again, at your local workshops, you're going to find these tips and more. You may not know it, but a lot of times the the, the platforms you're utilizing have already done the work for you to find openly licensed materials, uh, working together with Creative Commons, Google, YouTube, Flickr, and many more platforms have integrated Creative Commons into their search filters. And we'll take a look at that in a second. Um, if you are looking at a resource and you can't find a Creative Commons license, uh, scroll down to the bottom. Uh, look at the terms of use or the license or about us and click around a little bit. Uh, many times uh, the creators will not utilize, well, no, not many times. Sometimes the creators will not utilize a Creative Commons license, but they'll have a statement that says, this is free to use. Please give us credit. It's, so it's the functional equivalent of a 
Creative Commons attribution license. So poke around on a website or in a book. Also, uh, reach out to the creator if you're not sure of something. In, in, in my world, uh, we've had very good luck um, writing to public agencies uh, and explaining what we're doing. So uh, we have a, uh, a program in administration of justice or criminal justice uh, uh, that wanted, that's create, created OER books and they wanted to use some materials, some training materials that they found at a district attorney's office. And it was copywritten by, for the county. Uh, we wrote to them and explained what we're doing. They said, oh, sure, go ahead and use it. Same thing with our early childhood education. Uh, they wanted to use some material that was created by our state department of education. It was copywritten by, for the state of Cal, by the state of California. We wrote to them, hey, we're nonprofit. We're, do, we're you know, trying to get materials to students. Can we use your stuff? Sure, no problem. We had to fill out a couple of forms, but no problem. Uh, so don't don't let uh, uh, the lack of a license stop you if you really want to uh, provide your students with good material. And uh, one of the best ways to start your search is with the CCC OER email uh, or listserv. Uh, our my my co speaker this morning, Una Daly, is, is the director of CCC OER. Uh, so get on the CCC OER email. Uh, if you go to the CCC OER website, you can. Uh, click on the get involved or learn more button and, and sign up for the email list. That's a, that's a fabulous place uh, to look. Uh, let's take a peek quickly at some of the uh, platforms, uh, Google, uh, Flickr and YouTube. Again, they all have the ability for you to search specifically for Creative Commons licensed materials. Uh, the, the secret sauce is Google advanced search folks, my goodness. Google advanced search, scroll all the way down to the bottom and you'll find usage rights. And you can search, you can ask Google to only return searches for Creative Commons licensed materials. It's amazing. Uh, that's the way you can find a lot of stuff. You don't have to, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty quick way to, to, to get to some interesting search results, particularly if you're looking for images or discrete objects or, 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 uh, files on a, a very particular topic. Um, if you're looking for academic books, uh, you know, I want a freshman college level biology textbook or history textbook. Uh, you heard us mention OpenStax this morning. In addition, Oasis and Mom are really terrific uh, search tools. They do not these, these platforms do not contain content, but they link to and they search openly licensed content, educational content primarily. So those are great tools to utilize. Um, and again, I'll point you to your local OER council and your librarians who probably have uh, OER guides that, that, that can take you to many more tools, uh, search tools. In addition, uh, if you go to this bit.ly, forward slash OER searching, you'll find a list of, I don't know, the, the top 20, the top 20 sites for OER that I would use or my team would use. So you're you're welcome to, to utilize that, download that, copy it, share it. And let's recall that uh, we, I hope we are all engaged in ensuring that our students are encountering themselves to some extent in our teaching um, so that we're not just uh, parroting back the, the, the unequal and inequitable structures that our traditional uh, learning materials have. So uh, I really appreciate the uh, collections of images that are all, these are all openly licensed or no license, no restriction. They, they might not have a Creative Commons license, but they'll say free to use. These collections of images uh, that uh, look like our students. So plus size stock photos, you know, gosh, you know, not everybody in our, in our materials needs to look like a supermodel. Um, gender spectrum collection, people who are trans and binary and, 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 and so on. Uh, you can find images on, on that. A nappy is 
just beautiful. Nappy is a collection of photos, exactly what the title says. Beautiful photos of black and brown people for free. That's the title of the site. And, and my favorite is Women of Color in Tech. It's it, photographs, beautiful photographs, high-res photographs of black and brown people, uh, females, who are working on computers, working in, in, in technology situations. So, you know, if you're putting together a PowerPoint slide and you got that image of, you know, hands on a keyboard, well, they don't necessarily have to be white hands, right? They can be hands that look like our students. Um, and you can find more, uh, many more uh, of these on a blog post at the CCC OER uh, website. Uh, and there's a blog post entitled, Looking for Images that Reflect DEI. And their uh, resources contributed by, by the community, by people like us. So uh, real brief, and I know we're coming up on time. So I will share uh, best practices for uh, attributing work. So what happens if you find some work that you wanna use, you download it and you know, gosh, James told me I have to give attribution. I recognize that, that little person in the circle, I have to give attribution. How am I supposed to do that? There is a standard, you know, again, there, there's no, there are no police out there, but there's a standard as, as in any, any field. And the standard is tassel title of the work, author of the work or creator, source, the, the, the website, and the license. Uh, so you can see that uh, dis displayed here on the screen. Title, author, source, license. Uh, the easiest way that I found to actually do that is to utilize uh, Washington's Open Attribution Builder. Uh, you can just Google Washington Open Attribution Builder uh, and basically you copy and paste in the information from the website that you're taking the image from or the, the work from the book, the article, and you plug in uh, the particular spaces um, into Washington's open attribution builder and it builds an attribution. So this is the same image that I used at the outset of this presentation and down at the very bottom in very teeny tiny print, I had the attribution. I'm, blown it up a bit here so you can see. Uh, I didn't create uh, the attribution down at the bottom of the slide. Washington's Open Attribution Builder created that for me and I copied and pasted it. And uh, these are live links to the title of the image, the author and the author's website, the creator's website and the license. So it gives, gives me the ability to copy and paste a properly formatted attribution so that the creator gets credit. And so just, just, just like in our academic work using citations and footnotes, we want uh, subsequent users to be able to go back to the source. So uh, I will close by returning to the uh, definition of OER that we started with. OERs are freely available learning materials, but I've added materials that can be legally and ethically copied, shared, and edited. Uh, and that's what the license enables you to do. So again, if you're utilize, if you're creating materials, consider placing an open, uh, an open license or Creative Commons license on those materials. If you are searching for and using materials, please uh, utilize materials that are openly licensed and do so in a way that respects the rights and intent of the creator. And with that, I'll turn it back to Molly or to you for questions or comments. And I know we're getting up to the top of the hour. All right, thank you so much, James. That was very informative. Do we have any quick questions before uh, we leave for lunch and gather town? Uh, can we get a copy of your PowerPoint? Yes, and so we will be sending that out. Yeah, I'm gonna email, as soon as we're finished here, I'm gonna email it to Molly. Great. So I put a question earlier um, about videos like, if I show a movie in my class face-to-face, -face, can I legally put it online for my online students to watch because they are asynchronous? Um, I'll, I'll start, but then I'm gonna kick it to Molly. Okay. Uh, nine times out of 10, I'd say 99 times out of 10, uh, uh, the type of video or film that we're going to use as instructors will be copywritten and not have an open license on it. Uh, what many of us common, you know, normal people, not non-librarians of the world don't know is that the video that you buy for 
five bucks at the at the corner store is uh, licensed for you to use individually in the privacy of your own home with a limited audience. The video that your library buys for hundreds, hundreds of dollars, the same video, uh, carries with it permission to show it repeatedly to a larger audience and sometimes, but not always, in a digital format. Molly, did I get everything wrong? No, I would totally agree with what you said. <laughs> yes. So I would think, I mean, I, I understand the thought process there, but I would think if, especially if you're downloading a link of a copyrighted video, basically you're giving it away and it would definitely be violating copyright. We do have access to quite a few um, different videos through the library that that's kind of a workaround, like through, I don't know if you've looked at Hoopla before, that's one of them that I can think of off of the top of my head, canopy, but that would be, on demand. yeah, a canopy, thank yeah. you. I didn't, so that would be maybe a good workaround. Um, and then sometimes I know instructors just are trying to find films that are in the public domain, which it doesn't always work for the well, content well, that you want to show. One cool thing I've saw I, or the, about COVID I've seen in, um, like the technology technology world is um, a lot of places like Showtime, all these places, TED Talks, all of them uh, now allow you to create watch parties and send invites out to whoever. So they've kind of cut a little licensing, uh, you know, considerations. And I think you know that that's really good. Um, <clears throat> that the and I think there's even an online site where you could just create a watch party of whatever it is you're watching. Oh yeah, at, like at like YouTube, for example. Like, what's the difference between me displaying that video, right, or me just giving them the link and they watch it the same time I watch it? Yeah, that would be fine. That would be fine. Yeah, and, and I'd also say if 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 you have, you know, watched everything that's on YouTube and Netflix over the past ten months, and you're you know <laughs> you're done, um, check out the 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 streaming film. Uh, collections that your library has. Uh, there are a lot, probably, I mean, I know in my library, there, there are a lot of really cool documentaries and, and oftentimes foreign films or art films that, that don't pop up on Netflix or, or, or Amazon that you do find in the library databases. Yeah, and the library we have here also has a, a free membership to lynda.com. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you can learn literally anything technological you want for free. Yeah, that's a great source. All right. Well, I will let everybody uh, continue with their day. And thank you so much, James. That was just, that was wonderful. It's been a great morning. So appreciate it. And thanks thank to everybody you, who showed up. Yes. Okay. Um, thanks, James. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.